Tylius Troubles, Part 61 The Battle of the Via Diocleta Spring, 2403 Passing hurriedly through the villages of Frascotti, south of the great city of Rimas, and having insufficient time to loot and raise as they went, the double army of ogres, serving the tyrant Razga Boldeguts and his hired lieutenant Mangler, were continuing southwards along the ancient Via Diocleta. All of Remus would have breathed a sigh of relief, were it not for the fact that the city was internally tangled in turmoil, as the fanatical Disciplinati de Moor wrested control of its streets and gates one by one, and the citizens were distracted by the looming prospect of a vampire-led army descending upon them to do worse than even the ogres would have done. Raska's brute warriors were moving as fast as they could, which was not exactly quickly. Their vast, heavily laden baggage train was overflowing with loot and hauled by a chaotically cobbled together collection of ogres, slaves, horses and oxen, the latter three dwindling on a daily basis as they were eaten by their ravenous masters. They were being pursued by a similarly struggling force, the allied armies of Remas and Pavona, burdened with several large artillery pieces rather than wagons of plunder. The allied Tylians, however, being keen to exact revenge for the destruction of Pavona and to prevent the same fate befalling Remas, were pushing themselves to the limit. The ogres were working hard, but not so much as the men, for they were not fearful of meeting their pursuers in battle, merely trying to ensure their loot would not be lost. And so it was that the Allied army drew slowly and surely closer, crossing the rolling landscape from the town of Stiani towards the road without passing through Frascotti, and in this way aiming to intercept the foe long before they reached the realm of Ridrafa. They would meet in a barren place, home only to scattered flocks of sheep and their shepherds. The ogres, recognising at last that they were not going to outpace the Tylians, left the Via Diocleta to form an uncharacteristically carefully arrayed line to the west of the road, while the allied Tylian armies chose to draw themselves up for battle upon the road itself. The tyrant Razga's army, consisting of both his own brutes and the mercenary Mangler's band, presented a formidable line indeed. Warriors from both armies were intermixed, but Mangler's brutes were mostly concentrated towards the centre of the line, while Razga's forces made up the flanks. On the far right was a little mob of Noblar trappers, scurrying alongside a brace of Mornfang riders. Between these and the main fighting force were two companies of lead belchers and a large mob of Mangler's noblers. In the centre of the line were several bodies of bulls and iron guts, interspaced with Rhinox mounted war engines, behind which was the massive baggage train. On the far left were Razga's man eaters. Mangler's hunter with his brace of sabre tusks, as well as two small bodies of lead belchers and iron guts. Mangler led his own bodyguard of iron guts, clutching his massive, double handed cleaver and clad in layer upon layer of iron scales. Razga had joined the biggest of his two bands of bulls, along with his army standard bearer carrying an emblem of the bloody sword and half moon. His gut plate tusks marked him out, although the sheer bulk of his presence would suffice to do so, even without them. The Tylian alliance force was not so evenly proportioned as the ogres, as Duke Guidobaldo's Pavonan army made up much more than half the total strength. Nearly every unit on the right and in the centre of the line was Pavonan, and there were more of his troops, including his son Silvano, on the left. On the far most right rode one of only two bodies of horse in the entire army, being the plate-armoured nobility led by Vicomte Carjaval. Behind them was the as-yet-untested Hellstorm, a bizarre engine designed to throw a clutch of explosive rockets at the enemy, which Duke Guidobaldo had acquired through a null merchant in somewhat happier times. From there, towards the centre, were a succession of foot regiments, being halberdiers and handgunners, although for some reason Duke Scaringella had seen fit to order his Cathayan crossbowmen over to that flank, where they lurked in the rear of the line. The centre of the Allied line consisted of three large bodies of swordsmen, being Pavonans and Vassal Astianans, the latter now wholly incorporated into the Duke's army, and just as loyal to him 
as his native soldiers. Interspersed between these were four great cannons, two of which were tendered by engineers. Duke Guidobaldo himself watched from the rear, being the only Pavone and sporting colours other than blue and white. Most of Scaringella's Riemann army was arrayed upon the left. All were mercenary soldiers under effectively permanent contract, apart from a handful of native Riemanns. A large body of dwarf and warriors formed the force's main strength, behind which was the army's famously mysterious regiment of Cathayan halberdiers. The Riemanns' only piece of artillery separated these melee troops from the two regiments of crossbow troops, being a body of Tylean condottieri behind pavisas and more dwarfs. The army's baggage was clustered behind these two regiments, beside which lingered the bravi skirmishers pressed from the Riemann streets. Young Lord Silvano Gondi, Guidobaldo's lone surviving heir, having come all the way south from the terrible defeat at Tabino with the last of his elven Charlian riders, rode on the far left, while a company of Pavone and huntsmen had moved up to conceal themselves behind the rocky hill between them and the foe. As the last of the troops stepped into place, both armies came to a momentary halt, and an eerie, almost complete silence descended upon the Alliance army, broken only by the fluttering of flags and the occasional barking commands of Stand straight in your ranks and files, or Watch your dressings. The engineers gave final instructions regarding the elevation of the gun barrels, while Vicomte Cargival and his armoured knights struggled to restrain their destriers, while adjusting their shields, lances and helms. Everyone knew that soon all hell would break loose. The battle begins. The first to move were the Noblars on the far flank, scurrying up behind the hill, barely noticed by either ogres or men. What caught the Pavonan soldiers' eyes was the lonely advance of the hunter and his two beasts to the left of the centre. He strode boldly as they loped proudly, neither he nor they appearing even slightly concerned at the profusion of barrels, both big and small, up ahead. Perhaps refusing to be outdone by the hunter, the little company of man-eaters also chose to close on the foe, leaving the rest of Razga's battle line behind. Moments later, the rest of the brute army marched on, the three main bodies of ogres outpacing the lumbering war-machine-bearing beasts between them, while the smaller body of bulls on their left began to angle away a little, as if to follow the man-eaters. Mangler's butcher, Scabgash, marching front and centre of the largest body of bulls, now unleashed a powerful curse at the crew of the cannon before him, killing every one of them instantly by magically crushing their bones from inside. As the report of this rippled through the regiment directly on the cannon's right side, the despairing words met a similar report coming from the other side, for the huge iron blaster had fired a round shot more than twice as heavy as those employed by the Tylian's pieces, over Raska's head and right into another cannon, tearing it to pieces. It lay unrecognisable afterwards, with no sign of the crewmen who had been tending it only moments before. The Pavonans could barely believe what had happened. Men and horses had put themselves through hell to haul those guns from Pavona, with nigh upon a dozen animals perishing along the way from accidents or exhaustion, as well as two men. And yet here, before they had even fired once in anger, two guns were destroyed. Still, this gloomy thought was soon lost, for the somewhat distracting sight of the advancing brute army dislodged it from most soldiers' minds. The two bodies of lead belchers came up on the right, their flank unnecessarily secured by the noblars, and also fired, but to no noticeable effect, apart from a thunderous roar, flash and much smoke. Even now, with the ogres closing fast, the vast allied army seemed unready. Every man who could see the foe, and the Tylean alliance army was so big there were many who had yet to even glimpse them, craved to watch at least some ogres brought down before contact was made. Surely, with this many artillery pieces, handguns, crossbows, even rockets, the enemy would at least be blooded before the inevitable mayhem began. There was confusion at the rear of the battle line where the manifold roar of the enemy's guns had several men arguing over whether it was their own guns or the enemy's they had heard. One fellow pushed another to the ground for the insane suggestion that their own guns had yet to fire. All Duke Guidobaldo could do was give the command, Steady! He himself was behind his band of Astianan swordsmen, 
the brigand scum who had flocked to serve his conquering army even as their city was being plundered. He noted with a little satisfaction that the two cannons in front of him were just about to shoot. The archlector was also behind an artillery piece. His own quiet words were more numerous, taking the form of a prayer in preparation for the more potent prayers yet to come. If successful, those later prayers would not be so quiet, for they would invite the great god Mor to vent his wrath upon the enemy. At last, and the wait had seemed as long as it was terrible, the drums began to beat and the horns were sounded. The armies of Pavona and Remus were ready to act. Knowing that they had been caught off guard by the ogre's sudden lurch forwards, thus failing to deliver the barrage of shot they had fervently hoped for, they did not hold back now. Captain Ettore led the largest of the Pavone and Halberdiers regiment in a charge against the man-eaters, mainly because he was unwilling to be the recipient of their inevitable attack. Three of his soldiers died from the man-eaters' massive pistols, followed by nine more when they made contact, and all to very little observable effect against the thick-skinned brutes. But they stopped the ogre's advance and then, somehow, found the spirit to hold their ground and fight on. On the far right, the Vicomte Cargeval and his mounted men-at-arms smashed into the iron guts before them, killing two and wounding another. Not one knight had perished in the assault. The surviving brutes turned and fled, while the Vicomte ordered his men to restrain their pursuit in order to reform, facing the main body of the foe. The Riemann dwarfs, garbed in iron and steel from head to toe, marched in very fine order out from the battle line, wheeling a little to face the foe's main regiments in the centre. This allowed the Cathayans behind them to march up and fill the gap so created. The Pavonan huntsmen moved boldly over the rocky hill towards the lines of still-smoking lead belchers, whilst on the other side of the hill, young Lord Silvano led the last surviving Charlian riders in a charge against the Noblar trappers. The young lord was blooded by one of the vicious traps the greenskins lobbed to the ground before them. Half the Noblars died in this assault, and the other half fled in panic, only to be cut down by the riders pursuing them. Ominously, Silvano's pursuit took him and his riders right into the two monstrously large Mornfang cavalry, who were lumbering up that flank. As the Pavone and Halberdiers struggled to hold their own against their viciously strong and battle-hardened opponents, the Morite priests began chanting prayers in earnest, first cursing the flesh of one of the lead belcher companies on the enemy's right, then employing an amulet of coal to kill another of the same. An iron round shot plunged deep into the flesh of the rhinox carrying the iron blaster, yet the beast still lived. Another round shot felled one of Mangler's bulls, but the third cannon and the Hellstorm were unable to fire, most likely due to a combination of anxiety and overhaste on the part of the crewmen. Two thunderous volleys from the Pavone and handgunners brought down a brace of lead belchers, while the Cathayan crossbowmen wounded another. On the other flank of the army, the Riemann crossbow also felled a lead belcher and sent the rest of them running. Thus it was that using less than half the artillery pieces that they had arrived on the field with, they had managed to kill four ogres, wound several others and even send some running. Captain General Duke Scaringella cursed angrily, furious that they had been unready to loose with the full complement of artillery sooner. At almost that same moment, all the ogres who had turned to run now came to a halt, reordered themselves and rejoined the line. Those lead belchers on the right, who had not run away, now charged the huntsmen, while in the centre of the field a veritable avalanche of charges were made. Even the noblars joined in. As the knob mob hurled themselves over ambitiously at the dwarfs, Mangler led his iron guts with rather more assurance of success into the Astianan swordsmen. The fury of the fight was a horror to behold, as a dozen men were fatally crushed or torn apart, while themselves barely drawing blood from the ogres. Those that survived fled away, pell-mell, so panicked that it took them some considerable time to notice that they were not pursued, so completely broken that they never reformed. Thus, the last Astianan soldiers of any kind, those serving their conqueror, Duke Guidobaldo, were broken. Their town lay in lamentable ruins, its people decimated and thrown across Tylea, and now its only remaining soldiers were also scattered and lost. The butcher Scabgash and Mangler's army standard-bearer led a dozen bulls into Captain Augusto's swordsman, 
killing nine men with the sheer impact of their charge alone. Although Augusto managed to gouge the flesh of the enemy's standard-bearer, another half a dozen swordsmen were hacked in twain by the ogre's massive blades. Like their Astian and comrades, they too fled, but unluckily for them, the brute foe chose to run them down. Within moments, there was not one of them left alive, and the bulls found themselves stalled before the tiny obstacle of a lone Pavonan engineer, caught as he attempted to make his way from the smoking ruins of one gun to another. Razga led his own bulls into the flank of the halberdiers who had somehow halted the man-eaters. Although another man-eater was slain by halberd blades, within moments all but three of the Pavonans lay dead and dying. As these three fled, the man-eaters halted to allow their leader the privilege of pursuit, not that Razga went very far. Nevertheless, another Pavonan regiment had been entirely wiped out. The last two iron guts on the ogre's far left watched in confusion, as the hunter stumbled and his beasts halted, thus failing to reach the foe. Perhaps this was due to the hail of scrap that landed on top of them. The noblars on the scrap launcher had aimed rather badly. They were entirely ignorant concerning what they had done, for none paid any attention to where their shots were falling. Instead, they busied themselves with unusual efficiency in preparing for their next shot. Ahead of the scrap launcher, the iron blaster had turned to present its muzzle at the mounted nobility on the Pavonans' far right. The subsequent monstrous blast carried two knights and their horses away with it. As the Pavonan knights struggled to comprehend events, another of them fell mortally injured from the lead belcher's hail that moments later clattered through them. Vicomte Carjaval cursed loudly, yet although his men were dismayed, they were not yet broken, and so simply awaited his next command. Killing only one dwarf, but losing five of their own number, the Noblars nevertheless stood their ground, pinning the dwarfs and preventing their chance to flank any ogres. Young Lord Silvano and his elven riders, whose own momentum had carried them into the Mournfangs, now struggled to master their mount's fear, at both the foul stench and the size of their massive foe, and as a consequence not one solid blow could be laid upon the enemy. When all four elves then perished in a most bloody and horrible manner, Silvano, despite having faced far more terrible foes at Abino, recognised his situation was impossible, and so yanked at his reins in an attempt to escape. His horse turned, even managing a few steps, but was then gorged from behind by the Mournfang's huge tusks and hurled into the air. Silvano hit the ground hard, his own horse landing upon him. Barely noticing, the Mournfang riders simply urged their beasts onwards over the mangled mess of mounts, elves and noblemen. There were now a lot of ogres massed on the left of their line, in a somewhat higgledy-piggledy fashion. Facing them were a much greater number of Pavonan soldiers, mostly handgunners, but each ogre counted for a lot more than one man. While the handgunners readied their pieces for a volley at close range, the surviving regiment of Pavonan halberdiers charged at Habdok the Hunter and his hounds, while Vicomte Carjival and his mounted nobility attempted to reach the brace of lead belchers upon the slope of the hill. The foot soldiers successfully closed with their chosen enemy, but the knights failed due to the lead belchers choosing, quite sensibly, to flee. The Pavonan gunners manning the piece on the left of their own line frantically dragged their charge backwards so that the Cathayan halberdiers could close upon Mangler and his iron guts, aiming thus to prevent the ogres from attacking the dwarf's flank. Captain General Duke Scaringella joined them, stealing himself for the fight of his life. Indeed, a fight for his life. The Morite priest's prayers failed to cause any real harm, but the Allies had several many mundane means of doing so, which they now brought to bear. The dismounted pistoliers strode boldly forwards, weapons cocked in each hand, to fire their pistols at Razga Bolderguts and his bulls, killing two ogres. Both nearby regiments of handgunners joined the effort, but their powder was apparently inferior, for they could not fell even one ogre, instead merely scratching the foe's flesh. At the same moment, however, an iron round shot slammed messily through three ogres in the rear of Razga's other unit of bulls, killing them all, and a lucky shot from the Pavonan engineer's Hockland rifle also brought down one of the fleeing lead belchers. As the smoke cleared, the Pavonans were nevertheless dismayed, recognising that although they had hurt the foe, there were still too many remaining. The halberdiers fighting Habdok did manage to kill one of his beasts, but at such a heavy cost to themselves. Half a dozen dead, 
that they lost heart, broke and ran. The roar of the last sabre tusk, conjoined with the smell of spattered blood, spooked the knight's horses so much that the vicomte and his guard were forced to yield and allow them to bolt, otherwise they would have been thrown. Thus they found themselves, at the very moment they had hoped to deliver a coup de grace to one of the battered-bodied bulls before them, instead fleeing from the fight. Habdok and his last beast pursued the running halberdiers, thus hurtling into the dismounted pistoliers. On the far side of the field, however, the tide was turning in the Tylean allies' favour. Scaringella's Riemann cannon felled a mournfang and sent the last lumbering from the field, which made that flank look a lot less threatening. Apart from one or two lead belchers staggering about under the weight of their oversized burdens, there was little left of the foe. The Riemanns drew hope from the sight. Better yet, the dwarfs finally saw the Noblars off, then, coolly and with great discipline, reformed to face Mangler and his iron guts. For the first time that day, the Allies were squaring up for a fight that they looked like they might win. Like any ogre, Mangler did not wait for the enemy to charge. He led his warriors headlong into the Cathayan halberdiers beside the dwarfs, knowing in his gut that they were the softer of the two possibilities. Their relatively thin and less well-armoured bodies promised a speedy destruction. It should mean that he and his lads could smash right through them before the dwarfs could counter-attack his flank. Besides, he had spotted the enemy's baggage in the rear, and Greed always had a habit of getting the better of him. Behind Mangler, his bulls crashed into the last of the Pavonan swordsmen, right beside their lord Duke Guidobaldo. On the other side of the field, amidst a confusion of blue and white, with Pavonans running hither and thither, even through their comrades' ranks and files, Razga tore into and right through the handgunners closest to him before they could even bring their muzzles to bear. This was the beginning of the end for the Pavonans. The handgunners, what few were not only left standing, but also retained wits enough to do so, fled away, as did the other handgunners at their side, thus joining the halberdiers' frantic flight to form a turbulent river of broken men. The dismounted pistoliers would soon be swept up too. Vicomte Cargival, having successfully halted and reformed his noble men-at-arms, witnessed this sudden collapse. In that moment, his breath ragged with exhaustion, he chose not to sacrifice himself and the proud chivalry of Pavona in an almost certainly futile gesture of defiance. Instead, he gave the order to ride, and ride fast. He intended to find Duke Guidobaldo. He shouted to his men, We shall look to our lord's safety! What the Vicomte did not know was that Mangler's large regiment of bulls had made very short work of the last Pavonan swordsman, stepping forwards to find themselves in combat with the Duke himself. Having not fought personally in combat for nigh upon a dozen years, the Duke now found that his old abilities had not entirely abandoned him. Thankfully, he had continued to ride frequently and wear armour regularly, both practices which now stood him in good stead, despite his advancing years. Another boom advertised the Iron Blaster's next shot, its massive ball killing five of the Riemann dwarfs. The scrap launcher's effort was badly directed, however, for the burdened beast carrying the contraption had been startled by the Iron Blaster's report, and its heavy hail of sharpened iron poured upon the mules, oxen and wagons of the baggage train rather than the enemy's soldiers. Duke Scaringella, for more than a decade Captain General of the Riemann Army, as was his father before him, and in all that time, having not fought a single battle that was not already a foregone conclusion, now found himself in the deadliest of combats. He knew this was the moment his life had always been shaping him for, and that the rest of his life would be shaped by, which is why he chose to challenge the brute tyrant Mangler himself. His lance found its mark and grey flesh was pierced, but then Mangler's riposte almost broke the Duke's shield arm threatening to tear him from his saddle. Somehow, he held tight. Dropping his shattered lance, he tore his sword from its scabbard and screamed, Fight, boys! Fight! Crossbow bolts were loosed by the dozen, and a cannon boomed, killing two more of the lead belchers on the ogre's right and scaring the rest away. Then another cannon shot brought down the monstrous beast carrying the iron blaster, the ball almost taking its head from its shoulders. The dwarves now charged into Mangler's flank, and their butchery was astounding. As Mangler finally bashed Duke Scaringella off his horse, then broke the horse's neck with his elbow, the iron guts beside him were all but annihilated. Suddenly, the mighty Mangler found himself surrounded by a dizzying crowd of assailants. Their jabs, thrusts and slashes came from all quarters, 
while the weight of their numbers made it hard to discern one from another. Stumbling backwards, blood pouring from half a dozen gaps between his iron scales, he realised his huge bardiche was no longer in his hand. For the first time ever, his urge to fight was supplanted by something different. Before he could fully comprehend that it was fear, he was unconscious, falling beside the battered body of Duke Scaringella. One of the dwarfs scrambled over the brute tyrant's body, shouting, The Duke! and began to drag the armoured noble away. Duke Guidobaldo, having exchanged several blows with the enemy before him, enough he hoped to distract them sufficiently, now gambled his life on the obedience and strength of his mount. Yanking on the reins as he swung his hammer at the lead ogre's face, he turned about and urged his horse on. He had to outpace the brutes behind him, despite their size and despite the armour enclosing both him and his horse. His mount, reputed the finest in central Tylia, proved sufficient to the task, and the duke escaped the ogre's further harmful intentions, galloping as he had not done since his youth. The field had become divided from left to right, on one side of the field the Remans were reforming their line to face the foe, while on the other side almost every Alliance soldier had fled, leaving only Razga and his surviving warriors, as well as quite a number of Mangler's ogres, albeit in a rather less neat formation than the Remans. In between the two, the ground was strewn with ragged heaps of men and brutes, dead or wounded, as well as the smoking remains of several guns. The Remans still had two Pavonan cannons with them, as well as their own piece, and at such a distance they presented a sight which none of the ogres were glad to see. Those were the guns that had not yet failed. They had cut down mournfangs, rhinoxes and many an ogre, and there was no reason to suppose they would not continue to do so. Advancing on the last surviving Reman regiments would prove costly to the remnants of Razga's army, perhaps even fatal. As his brutes began to reform their ranks and files, Razga took a breather and gave the situation some thought. He could see that the loot was safe. Not a man had got close to the heavily burdened wagons. Scrutinising the field ahead, he guessed that Mangler must surely have fallen in battle, simply by the fact that neither he nor any of his iron gut bodyguard could be seen. Razga decided this suited him just fine. Almost all the loot in the baggage train had been Mangler's, payment and bribes for his continued mercenary service. If Mangler was dead, then the loot was for the taking, as was command of Mangler's warriors. If Razga left now, with all the loot, and whichever lads could still march, that would not be so bad. Indeed, it was probably better than things had been before the battle, when virtually none of the loot was his, and only half his army could be trusted. Razga's mouth twisted into a grin, as wicked as it was fierce, and he shouted to two of his lads to listen up. The dwarfs dragged Duke Scaringella away from the heap of dead and dying Cathayans, then turned him over to look at him properly. There was no sign of life in his eyes, and his chest plate was caved in so deep that his ribs must all have broken and his lungs burst beneath. They laid him down gently, then all but one returned to their places in the regiment, while one of them ran towards the arch lector to deliver the bad news. To the south of the battlefield, Duke Guidobaldo Gondi had rendezvoused with Vicomte Cargival, and was now riding, somewhat faster than the scattered clumps of foot soldiers around him, in a wide arc to avoid the foe and get to the Riemann lines. There he hoped to find his son and whatever remained of his army. Back at the ogre's wagons, noblars, draft slaves and bulls alike watched with suspicion as two ogres, Razka's lads, raced towards them. As they drew close, the nearest shouted, Hitch him up and get ready to shift. We're moving off now. One of the bulls by the wagons, called Gordok, strode forwards, a great long whip in his hand. On whose say so? he demanded. Razga's orders, came the answer. I take orders from Mangler, like most of us here. Razga can ask if he wants some shifting done. You'll not be getting orders from Mangler no more, said the new arrival, laughing. Ha! Huh! So if you know what's good for you, you'll shut it and do as you're told. <laughs>